I've read dirty code, you've read dirty code. The big problem is that if I were to ask you how many of you have read dirty code over the past month, I'm sure that most of you would have raised their hands. Opportunities for turning things around and promoting clean code are all around us. And today we'll see how you can take advantage of those. <coughs> we'll also take a look at a few tools which worked for us at Wix and some which haven't. Honestly, we accidentally stumbled on our ways as it was just a side effect of trying to mitigate a serious technical debt issue. But Wix constantly tries to experiment and embrace new techniques which help us iterate quickly and better. And that's why we continue to invest in it. <clears throat> if you're here, you're probably passionate about clean code. By the end of this presentation, you will all have the option to choose if you're taking it to the next level. So my name is Itai Zeidman, and I'm the head of the server guild at Wix. Previously, I was the server software infrastructure team leader, and I'll touch on both of them in a sec. Uh, I've been a clean code fanatic for around five years, and I still remember the day that a coworker re recommended Uncle, Uncle Bob's clean code. And I remember reading the book on the way home and, and being mesmerized by such small truths being crystallized. And I've been working at it ever since, and I hope I'll, I'll just continue with it. Last but not least, I'm a proud father and uh, spouse of three daughters. So he, who here knows what wixing is? Yeah, so I just recently found out what this means, but we are trying to take it to a whole different uh, uh, meaning. So Wix is a website building platform. We're home to over 70 million users. We grew from 50 to 1,000 employees in under six years, and we have around 350 developers. Our production topology is pretty polyglot, and you can find Erlang, Ruby, Python, Node, but our main bread and butter, over 150 microservices, is JVM. So we have mostly Scala, but also some legacy Java. And we have around 70 developers working on this uh, platform. This platform is uh, powered by open source, an internal framework, and shared libraries that we call the infra, or the infrastructure. That handles just some of the RPC, monitoring, security, test infrastructure, service lifecycle, and some more. Just to get some numbers, we have over 15 libraries there and uh, over 60 contributors outside of the team. Th this story is from the middle of our journey. And the context is legions of developers trying to request more features and changes. And I'm all by myself handling those 15 libraries riddled with technical debt. And my boss and I tried to think, how can this be sustainable? And we said, OK, if you need a feature, you have to contribute it or have to wait until it gets out of the backlog. And that got some pretty uh, big backlashes, but that's a whole different topic. We did it for some time, and then a junior developer uh, needed a feature, and he was requested to contribute it, just like everyone else. The submitted contribution was very poor on all counts of design, cleanliness, coverage, and we did a few cycles of online, offline code review, which helped, but they didn't drive the message home. So I went to my boss and I told him, are you sure you want me, are you sure you want me to do it with him? Maybe I should just do it either now, if you think it's critical, or have it enter the backlog. And he said, I don't care how you do it, but everyone has to be able to contribute to the framework. If you want to clean up after them, that's also okay, but everyone has to be able to contribute. And I said, I'm not going to clean up after anyone. So we did a few more cycles, and I saw that it's not finishing. And I went to my boss again. I told him, listen, it's now hurting the deadline of other features. And he said, I don't care. Everyone has to be able to contribute. And we, we ended up at around seven or eight cycles, which was a big, pretty, pretty big investment on my part. But uh, the end contribution was very clean. Future, uh, future pull requests from that developer were much, much cleaner and took a lot less cycles. But the big aha moment for me, the big game changer was that around a week later, that developer came up to me and told me, all excited, you know, I did a home project on GitHub and I did it TDD-wise and I saw how the test drove the API and how they, 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 they explained the business features and so on and so on. I, I was really excited. First of all, because 
I love TDD, and so when I, saw, when I see others excited about it, then I, I get psyched. But more so, when I saw that we worked on one thing, the infra, and it propagated to a whole different area, his own project. And so we start to understand that we maybe have a path here to spreading clean code. So we understood two truths during this process. The first is that clean code is not going to happen naturally. So Wix is a fast growing company, both in terms of business and number of developers. When we started out, everyone uh, contributed to the infra. But when everyone became an abstract enough notion, it meant no one was responsible. So basically, you know, you saw commits with a lot of code smells. We all know, we all know those bad naming, long methods, lack of coverage. And it's not like all commits were uh, shameful commits, you know, commits that you take a look and see, how could he have pushed it? We also had those commits, but most of them were just not a game. Commits that you saw that someone could have done better, but didn't have the time or didn't have the effort. And <clears throat> we, uh, we thought about wh why this is happening, and we came to the conclusion that what, what was mi missing mainly was ownership and context. Ownership over the long haul, that you see that something is actually being decayed and you, take, uh, and, and, and you handle it, and context. Now, these two smells, I think, uh, show, show, show context the most. Code duplication and high coupling. Let's say you have two libraries, A and B, and you need a feature in B. Now, you see a couple of lines in A that do what you need or help you with what you need. You have a few options. You can duplicate the code from A to B and be done with it, but then you're duplicating the code. You can just have B depend on A, although they have no relation whatsoever, and that's you have high coupling. Or you can say, okay, maybe these few lines are actually a new library, C, and they have A and B depend on it. But that requires context, knowing what A actually does, what B actually does, giving a name to C, which gives it a single responsibility. And, um, and so naming is hard. And we understood that basically you have to face it head on because if you don't, every intersection of your code base becomes riddled with landmines. And we all know that those tend to blow up when you least have the time to expect them. So here's how we tackled it. Clean your own code. I first decided to raise the bar myself. Now, we all know that you can take a look at commits you did like six months ago, a year from now, and you say, oh my god, I don't believe that I actually did it. What was I thinking, so on and so on. Guilty, same, same with me. But the standard I, I put for myself was that the day I pushed the code, I knew that I did, couldn't do any better. That it's not like I said, yeah, I'm not sure, but I don't have the time that I go back to it. Yeah, maybe, I'm not sure, I don't have the time to actually talk with anyone. And this helped me promote clean code, first of all, in the sense that it, it, it put a standard out. People saw what I demand of myself and started to implicitly see what I demand of them. But more importantly, we, I walked in the same shoes. So when someone comes up to me and say, what, do you really extract one line just to remove that code duplication or just to enhance readability? And I can tell them. And I can tell them, yeah, of course. You can go and look there and look there and also look at that third place where I didn't extract that one line because I didn't think it's re relevant. So, Actually doing the work and not just talking about it is a crucial, crucial part. Dirty code contributions still kept coming in. Remember the birth story? It's, if it's not clean before the push, it won't be clean. I first started by adding email, uh, email post, uh, push email notifications, and I read through all the code that was pushed. And I tried to talk to people about it. I went up to them and said, oh, I saw your commit, excellent work. What do you think about doing this and this change? And people were very, very receptive. They were very, very positive, but they never had the time to do it because they were always busy with their next feature. So I understood that I have to draw the line somewhere, and it has to be before the push. You are the gatekeeper of good contributions. I closed off pushes to master and moved to forks and pull requests on GitHub. Now that stirred up a hornet's nest from people being offended 
thinking that uh, we don't think they're good enough engineers, to people th saying, okay, if you don't want my contributions, then I, I, won't, I won't do it. And that required the process. First of all, to explain to people that it's not that hard technically, how do you do, how do, you do pull requests from IntelliJ? How do you do it from the GUI? How do you do it from command line? What do you do after you get uh, comments that you can just push and it gets added to the pull request? So that's one part. But the other part, maybe the more important one, is the human one-on-one. -on -one. To explain to people that the need is actual and it's not just a control issue. But then a backlog began forming up. And we understood that contributions have to be sustainable for you, meaning um, reduce over time the amount of work you do for each pull request from, the, from uh, a specific developer. For them, reduce the number of back and forth, reduce the frustration. For us, it meant fun, uh, establishing a conversation. Making a con uh, building a conversation where you talk about the motivation for each change. Not only do this and do that, but actually explain, yeah, you see this change, maybe if you remove this code duplication, then you can see that this abstraction appears. This conversation helps people actually understand and implement over time what you expect. Talk about design and TDD, not only end, uh, end uh, result. Say, okay, you see, but if you would have driven this via TDD, then maybe this API would have been less cumbersome. And most importantly, build a conversation where the contributor and the reviewer feel content. The reviewer doesn't feel that they got shoved down with the contribution that they have to accept, and that the contributor feels that they were honored through the process and they weren't just uh, stamped upon. So we identified five key elements of a good contribution. Number one, info relevance. The contribution should help several projects. If you have a feature that you think people will need, or if you have a feature in your own project and you just want it out, please keep it in your own project. Or go and talk to people and convince them that they actually need it and they don't understand. That's excellent. But if we don't see an actual need, a need bigger than, than one uh, uh, service, we don't want it. A smaller code base is a code base that is easier to clean up. You ain't gonna need it. Contribute the least code possible and add features later. Even if we agree that, that, that this feature should go in, let's have the smallest thing we, we, we can add. This can contradict with stable APIs, but it's a, it's a balance that we're working on day in and day out. The Boy Scout rule. Contributions leave existing libraries code cleaner. So, like we said, technical debt, right? Okay, you go in and you contribute, just a small change. But we expect you to either rename a test method, which talked about how something was implemented, to why, why it's doing like this. What's the business value? Extract a private method to help remove the clutter, or any other local change that you as a contributor feel is relevant to the contribution site. TDD, every API has a purpose and was driven by a test. So when we talk about TDD, we talk about TDD goose style, growing object-oriented software, if you know the book. If no, if not, go and read it. Outside in TDD, <coughs> business value. For us, this allows us to see that actually APIs were needed and not just imaginary. Even if a contribution wasn't driven by TDD, and those are rare but sometimes happen, we require regression confidence. Less than 100% confidence is unacceptable. Why is that? Simple. If we don't have 100% confidence, then we can't clean the code. We can't refactor knowingly that uh, we, we won't push this library and tomorrow our service, one of, the, one of those 150 services will break. We found that for a mid-sized contribution and up, getting a 100% confidence level is very unlikely for uh, code that wasn't driven in TDD, but we're open to that discussion. So, this is so important that please, take a moment, tweet it to your friends, send it to your coworkers, this is how you can get started. The third rule, 
So we talked about cleaning your own code. We talked about harnessing contributions. And then you get to mentor. Honestly, mentorship is something that we only identified after the fact that we're doing. Because we, we saw that this is our, this is our day to day. So for us, it meant ongoing mentorships. Every new team member that, 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 uh, that joins the team is basically brainwashed with these practices and these techniques. And every code review talks about the smallest detail possible so that, uh, so that it becomes a second nature. And one time off mentorships. So every, every team member gets approached a lot because as we said, this code base is, uh, is, uh, is read by many developers day in and day out, either wanting to take a look at a feature or wanting to request a feature. And team members use these interactions to talk about their code. Why did you do this? Maybe, maybe you don't need the new feature and you could just use this existing feature. Maybe you should remove this code duplication. Or, hey, I saw that you're using this third party library, but maybe you should just try to use this uh, this API, not that, that API. Now, the question arises, did we have to use the infra to promote clean code? A friend asked me, do you think the infra team is just better? And that's why they, they took it upon themselves to, to promote clean code <clears throat> and to be those champions. And, and it, it, took, it took me some time to answer, to, get, to give an honest answer. And I think that partly, yeah, if you, if you're part of the infra team, then you have to be a seasoned developer. Because to write a framework, you have to have used a few and know the ins and outs. But that ratio, that just means that the ratio of seasoned developers is hiring the team, but those developers are also in all of our other teams. The real game changer, the turning factor, was our decision to make it a priority. Our decision to say part of how we measure ourselves is the velocity of other developers over time. That and management's backing of this. So part of how we measure ourselves is whether clean code um, is, uh, is, is promoted over time. So how can you take it from here? Face it head on. Understand that clean code is not going to happen naturally, and you have to do something about it. Make it a priority inside your team, with management. So do, it, do something that is alive and actually happens day in, day out. Find your tools. These are what worked for us, but yours might, have, might very well be different. Clean your own code. Harness contributions. Mentorship. Question? Um, so I think the main tool here uh, in the tool set that you said is maybe the most crucial part is code reviews. Uh, do you think that this applies to startups or small teams? Like, how would you see this rolling out in a team of maybe five that are just starting out and need to iterate fast and then find uh, product and market fit? Okay, so first I'll repeat the question. The question was uh, whether uh, that the main tool is, uh, is, is code reviews and uh, do I think that it's relevant for startups that need to iterate quickly and find the product fit for small teams? So uh, I think that one major difference uh, for, uh, for a startup is that the code base is small and that the feedback loop for three, five developers sitting in the same room and um, reading the same code. So basically, people are, are uh, hitting themselves, you know, w w one against the other, day in and day out. And so the friction is, is, is much higher. So I, I don't know if, if in a startup you have to have um, code reviews for every push. Um, because, because code is red. I've been in a few startups before, and I, w without code review, we all reviewed each, other, each other's code. Just because you have to. You, you're touching this part of the code base now, and tomorrow you're touching that part of the code base. That, that being said, I think that code reviews can help every team. But uh, the, the, uh, the ratio or, or how you implement code reviews can change between different settings. Uh, from, from my experience, one, one of the you just said a feedback loop. So I think uh, uh, the length of the feedback loop is, is, very, is very important. Uh, did you set any guidelines to what you expect is tolerable with regards to how fast you respond 
to a contribution? Like, uh, was that a factor? Uh, did external developers uh, feel that maybe X amount of time was too long and it uh, caused friction? Or uh, and the question was uh, feedback loop. Do uh, uh, did we set guidelines for? Uh, feedback loop about a contribution. Did uh, contributors feel uh, friction or uh, um, discontent over the time it took us to respond to contributions? So, first of all, yeah, people uh, people felt discontent, and um, and we did not set. We, we started out with uh, with pretty strict guidelines, and we saw that uh, we we're, we're not we're not uh, uh, we're not getting there because uh, the balance between contributions and generating, uh, generating our own features uh, is something that, that needs to be met, because you have to remember, we're a team of uh, three. We, I, was, I was in the team, we were three. Oh, uh, uh, on 70 developers, the amount of contribution can be much higher. So uh, what we did, uh, did try is to guarantee that a small contribution that is clean gets handled fast. So basically, every contribution gets looked at uh, around 24 hours after it's submitted. And if it's small and clean and was TDD, it will, it, it, will, it will be merged very quickly. If it's a big contribution, you know, you have now 30 files, and you have to go and see, wait, OK, how was it, how was it driven? Do I actually have full confidence here? Um, is it, is it critical enough, and so on, and so on. So, so yeah, it, 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 the feedback loop will take, uh, will take time, and it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a pain point. So this is something that we're actively thinking on how we can do it. We, we, we're currently taking a look at uh, maybe doing a um, rotation, saying, OK, this week, uh, Joe will be the one uh, responding to, uh, to pull requests, and uh, trying to give, like, he won't, this week he won't be expected to do any features. If he will be able to, then that, that's excellent. But uh, first priority is to handle contributions. We haven't started that, that yet. We're going to roll it out uh, during the, the next few months, and we'll see how it goes. Thank you.